Did you catch the story about what Hunter Biden's lawyers, representatives of his legal counsel, apparently did? He, I he, don't know who the hell they think they are that they could get away with this, but tell everybody what. Well, they he's did. he's scheduled to uh, appear in court Within to find hour. out whether or not the judge is going to accept the plea bargain that he's entered into with prosecutors. And the report is that representatives of Hunter Biden called the clerk of the court misrepresenting themselves as representatives of House Republicans who had submitted effectively an amicus brief with the court providing evidence as to what uh, in, in, in furtherance of the argument that the judge should not accept the plea bargain to which the parties have agreed that she should impose more severe sentencing consistent with the guidelines or uh, just uh, uh, set aside the plea bargain for you know, further determination. So Hunter's attorneys called the clerk allegedly representing themselves as representatives of the House Republicans saying, ignore what we submitted. Yeah, or heavily redacted. I mean, what are they, the jerky boys? Making, hello, <laughs> they say stand. Right. They should have. The refrigerator's running. They should have, I mean, the, the clerk should have known when not to check. she was called sizzle chest by one of the. Uh, I mean, what, what is what can the judge do to them? What should she do to them today? Saul Greenberg called and said, "I'm suing you for the punitive damages that you're giving me." Uh, that should have been a tip off, but uh, she they had until I guess last night to show cause as to why sanctions should not be considered for misrepresentations to the court. So we'll see what happens today. Not only if that's true, then not only should they be sanctioned, they should be up for disbarment whoever the responsible parties are. It's just unbelievable. It's just the arrogance of these people, of Biden and the people that surround themselves and their attorneys and representatives. And, of course, this is something else that they thought they could get away with. This actually folds in nicely into a piece that's written by our friend uh, Theodore Dalripple over at Law and Liberty, lawandliberty.org, about intellectual dysfunction. The professionals, the experts... The officers of the court, you know, all the betters that are supposed to be the institutional guardians of our civilizational, uh, you know, civilizational power centers like courts of law. And yet, as he uh, reminds us, the big question being debated in certain academic circles over the last couple of years in part because of a spoof, and I'll, he had fun with it, so I'll let him have his fun. You know, you, we've heard the discussion of what is a woman. You've got a sitting Supreme Court justice that couldn't define that. What about the question that was asked uh, in an academic journal about five years ago, six years ago now? What is a penis? Have we reached a conclusion on that? Theodore Dalrymple is contributing editor of City Journal. He's also a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute and the author of many, many books, including Life at the Bottom and Romancing Opiates. Theodore Dalrymple, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Well, thank you for asking me. So did we get to um, the uh, answer to that uh, pressing question, what is a penis? Um, well, I think most of us got to the uh, answer fairly early in our lives, but uh, apparently, uh, apparently not for certain um, intellectuals and uh, theorists. You're referencing uh, this academic spoof that was put on by James Lindsay and Peter Bogosian six years ago, where they submitted these absurd papers. And they were peer-reviewed and published in, you know, academic journals like uh, Cogent Social Sciences. Uh, this was the, um, as you excerpted in your piece, this was sort of the thesis statement from this uh, spoof submission. Penises are problematic, and we don't just mean medical issues like erectile dysfunction and crimes like sexual assault. As a result... A result of our research into essential the essential concept of the penis and its exchanges with the social and material world, we conclude that penises are not best understood as the male sexual organ, 
or as the male reproductive organ, but instead as an acted social construct that is both damaging and problematic for society and future generations. So what are we to do about the penis? And um, people are take t- people take this seriously, and and as you write about, and then the damage control after they are punked and embarrassed as they were is even uh, even more ridiculous than the spoof submissions. Uh, yes, I mean some some people said, well, it might have been a spoof, but actually it was uh, it was enunciating the truth. Uh, uh, r- uh, Right. The, 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 yeah, I mean, this is, this is a worthy debate about uh, defining what this yes. is and whether it's just an entirely a social construct, a male reproductive organ. In, in making a joke, they were saying something that was true. And, uh, that and, was the argument. Right, and you, you call this uh, sort of thing, what, what's happened here with these academic journals and what happens with these absurd studies that are not too far off from the spoofs, you call that state-funded stupidity. What do you mean? Well, what I mean is th- at least third-party-funded stupidity. I dare say that uh, some universities, of course, have private um, uh, private funding. But nevertheless, uh, it, it, uh, these these uh, ideas are funded from uh, by uh, and certainly in Europe by the state and probably to a large extent in America also by the state. They, people are paid to write in this fashion. Uh, they write whole books in this fashion. Um, I have on occasion been asked to review some of them. Um, I haven't done it with great pleasure, I must say. Uh, but uh, uh, this kind of nonsense is now standard in large part of academia. Uh, a good example of this uh, getting uh, away from the the gender silliness is something that's um, more serious. I mean, I, in the sense of uh, uh, life and death. This a study that was just published by uh, the Journal of the AMA, the Journal of AMA Surgery, I guess, the specific publication. Uh, this brought to us by uh, one of your colleagues at City Journal, Ian Kingsbury. And they're looking for uh, the association uh, between structural racism and mass shooting events in U.S. cities. And they they use a lot of weaselly words to essentially suggest there is some sort of connection. And they uh, use uh, junk stats to uh, buttress their case, too. They um, uh, perpetrators, white perpetrators commit 49 percent of mass shootings compared with 19 percent by black perpetrators. What they fail to disclose and what the author points out is, well, uh, since whites represent about 50 percent of the population, a little bit more than that, they're underrepresented in mass shooters, whereas blacks at 19 percent are 50 percent overrepresented. So what does that tell us about structural racism? Absolutely nothing. It tells us that you're just trying to connect things that don't have any obvious connection and you're sort of papering over the lack of a connection with um, you know, your own stylized correlations. So but th- th- this is an example of what's out there to justify all sorts of things, whether it is um, race-based policies or in, we were just talking with Steve Moore about uh, all the junk science in the area of, of climatology, whether it's uh, used to justify, you know, taking the uh, gas stove out of your home. Yes, well, I, 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 the... Uh... The medical journals are full of uh, correlations supposedly showing uh, causation, although, of course, everyone knows that uh, association is not causation. But if you take the, that particular example of the, uh, of the mass shooting, uh, uh, a, a fairly, well, a minimally able uh, academic would be able to uh, to turn what you've said on its head and say that actually this just goes to show that there is a very strong correlation uh, between um, uh, structural racism and mass shooting because, of course, uh, people who are uh, in a very unfortunate position psychologically are um, are prone to mass shootings and, of course, uh, black people are are prone or have uh, an unfortunate psychological uh, situation because of uh, structural racism. So no 
no statistics could actually uh, refute the, um, the uh, premise on which this kind of thinking is based. Uh, and, and, and the explanation for uh, the seemingly endless stream of these sort of specious uh, academic articles that appear in all of these journals, what, what's, the, my, what's at play? Yeah, my explanation, and I, I agree that I can't actually prove it, I couldn't go into court and say I have definitive proof of this, but I think that most of this writing is seeking power rather than truth. And uh, they're trying to impose the uh, people are part of a class that are trying to impose themselves on uh, on the rest of society. In Britain, I don't know whether you've noticed this, um, a conservative or right wing politician called Nigel Farage had mm-hmm. his um, had his bank, bank account closed down uh, by a bank, which claimed to be inclusive, although you have to have. Uh, about four million, I think three or four million dollars to open an account there. So it's not all that it is. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> but uh, anyhow, uh, he has uh, he had his bank uh, account closed down uh, by a uh, by a bank that prides in itself on uh, these kinds of uh, reasoning, and um, and I think this actually demonstrates how how deep the problem is because if a bank uh, if a bank staff is kind of infiltrated by this kind of thought then it has gone further than uh, than even I had thought power is the only good it's the only thing worth having truth has no value and nothing to do with it that's uh, Theodore Dalrymple's summation of what we're seeing and the manifestations are just examples of that Theodore Dalrymple Contributing editor, City Journal, Senior Fellow at the Manhattan Institute, author of books including Life at the Bottom and Romancing Opiates. Theodore Dalrymple, thanks as always for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. It's like a hot, steaming cup of information to start your day. It's Chicago's Morning Answer on AM 560. The Answer. Was completely gone. All of our memories being wiped away. The rain is what got 20 us. minutes of sheer terror. And you can feel it in your body. I watched the fire move down the canyon. The rumbling of the house. My son started screaming, We're gonna die, we're gonna die. 